And so if you make something that's worthwhile, if you are able to bring a technical solution to the table that will make things better and you don't market it, you're stealing. Boom. What's up, Internet? Josh Miles here. And today we are doing something really special that I never thought I'd be saying to you. Today, I have the distinct privilege of interviewing the one and only Seth Godin. Many of you know that I host two different podcasts. One is called Obsessed with Design. You can learn more about that over at ObsessedShow.com and also another show called PSM Show. You can learn more about that one at PSM dot show which is all about professional services marketing in the AEC world so today I'm interviewing Seth for the second podcast called PSM show and we're going to ask him all about business to business and professional services marketing and want to learn more about his book that I just finished listening to called this is marketing so without further ado please enjoy my conversation with Seth Godin well, Seth, it is an honor and a privilege to have you on today. Um, I just finished listening to the audio book version of This Is Marketing, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I found myself you. tweeting your definition of marketing right out of the gate. So um, thank you for pulling that together in the way that you've done, um, you know, Purple Cow and Tribes in the past kind of unpacking a certain issue. This one is really more of like a manifesto to me. Did it, did it feel that way as you were writing it? Well, I rant all the time, so um, I'm not sure it felt like more of a rant than usual. It's personal in the sense that I think I'm trying to speak up not just for the people who want to make change, but for the culture in which they're making change. And I think for too long, marketers have gotten away, not all marketers, some marketers have gotten away with a selfish narrative, and that doesn't lead to a better place to be. Well, as I was preparing for today's conversation, I reached out to some folks on Facebook and to LinkedIn just to crowdsource some some possible questions. And, and I got, I think, a pretty good one. This is from Michael Venn, who's a Canadian theater performer and a photographer. And he said, ask Seth about his wife's gluten-free bakery and how building that, you know, how you were involved in it and how maybe that influenced your view of brand or marketing. Um. My wife runs the biggest gluten-free bakery of its kind in the world. Uh, my involvement in it consists of sometimes delivering wedding cakes in the middle of the night and uh, <laughs> building the first version of their IT system. It does not involve any of their marketing, uh, their collaterals, any of that. It's all her. Uh, but it's a great case study because most people will not go a block out of their way for a gluten-free, dairy-free uh baked good, but the people who want a gluten-free, dairy-free baked good will go 50 blocks out of their way for it. Not only that, but baked goods are shared. Few people happily eat baked goods by themselves, which means that when you're buying baked goods for a family event, you need to think about everyone who's going to be there. And the old strategy was most people get one thing and everyone else who's got a restriction gets a banana. But if you buy what she sells, everyone is included. That's the change she seeks to make, to make this festive engagement inclusive. And so she has grown to be in almost 50 Whole Foods and four retail outlets and more than 60 people by sticking to a very simple idea, which is this isn't for everyone, but it might be for you. Yeah, that's uh, certainly a theme that, that I hear over and over um, in This Is Marketing and of course in your um, your blog, your daily email and everything. Um, another really great question that came across from a woman named Jen McGovern, who's uh, one of our SMPS members in Washington, DC. She was talking about how in the professional services and architecture and engineering world, a lot of our technical staff become these reluctant marketers. Yeah. So. Um, I loved how, especially at the end of This Is Marketing, you talked about how it really is our responsibility to market. Um, how might you encourage these non-marketers who've become sort of accidental marketers? All right, so let, let me start with a, a nonprofit example that's not quite as close to home and then go straight to the engineering focus. If, uh, if someone gives $50,000 to charity, a philanthropist, what do they get? They're not doing it because they get a tote bag. Right. They're doing it because they get a feeling, a story, 
a connection, status, all of those things. How much is it worth? How much is it worth to them if they give $50,000 to this charity? Well, I would argue it's worth at least $75,000 because if it wasn't, they wouldn't do it. What does that mean? It means that if you as a fundraiser aren't willing to be in the right place with the right story to get, earn that $50,000 donation, you just stole $25,000 from this person. Because the fact that they couldn't give you the 50000 means they don't get all the bonus feeling that's left over. You're stealing. And so if you make something that's worthwhile, if you are able to bring a technical solution to the table that will make things better, and you don't market it, you're stealing. You're stealing the value from the person you could have helped. If you're a lifeguard and you don't rescue a drowning person, you're killing them. And so when I think of, you know, I'm a trained engineer, semi-trained. I got a degree in it anyway. <laughs> and um, engineers are taught that there is a right answer. And they are taught that the result is the result. And therefore, many engineers are frustrated with the idea of marketing. So when I was at Yahoo, it was run by a couple of software engineers who said, we don't do any marketing at Yahoo, which was nonsense. <laughs> they just didn't do what they thought of as marketing. But the name, the logo, the way the homepage made you feel, the yodel, you go down the list. There was all this marketing about why you should use Yahoo instead of Alta Vista. And there was no discussion about did Alta Vista come back 10 milliseconds faster or slower. So marketer, engineers, scientists who seek to make change should take their own medicine and realize just handing people uh, cold fish on a platter and assuming they'll eat it because they should figure out that it's sushi? No, that our job is to help people see that we can make things better because if we can't help them see that, then things aren't going to get better. Yeah, I really appreciated your example, how you talked about the donation really isn't for the fundraiser, it's for the donor, that they are, they are getting just as much value, if not more, than what the fundraiser is receiving. So I guess if we, if we take that same principle and apply it to the engineer, if they really believe that they are giving a better service to the world, it's in their best interest to the universe to, to market that and tell people about it. That's right, because we don't get to market at people anymore. We have to market with them. We have to do it for them. And if you want to figure out how to get people to take their tuberculosis medicine, you don't do it by making tuberculosis medicine more effective for people who take it. You make it so that people who aren't taking it tell themselves a different story that causes them to take it. You know, switching gears a little bit, you know, I'm a graphic designer by background and I'd worked with some soft software startups in a former life hearing a lot about MVP and minimally viable product. And I loved your concept of this minimal or minimum viable audience. Can you riff on that a little bit for us? So what marketers have taught us for so long is everyone should be your customer. And the goal is mass. The goal is more. And that causes you to make average stuff for average people. It causes you to go to committee meetings and sand down the edges. It causes you to say, you, know, you should come in 82 different languages and we should have a version for left-handed people and tall people and short people and how do we make it for everyone? And as soon as you do that, you're making it for no one because there's already something average on the market that if you instead say, we seek to serve this specific group of people, if these 1,000 people who we know by name, by psychographic, by identification, this 1,000 people wanted this more than anything in the world, that would be enough. Because to make that product is scarier and requires a lot more responsibility than to make something that's average for everyone. So once you become a meaningful specific, you're on the hook. And what you get out of that is the ability to make it better for them. And if you make it irresistible to that group of people, the cool thing that happens next is they tell their friends. And it's when they tell their friends that the word spreads because marketing is not yelling at strangers. Marketing is what story do people say, use when they talk about you? Seth, I would definitely argue that you have become a meaningful specific to the world of marketers. I wonder if um, you feel a sense of responsibility for helping drive marketing to where it's going. Okay, so let me just 
uh, dis dissuade you from what you just said. <laughs> uh, it was really inclement here the other day, and I work. I live about a mile from my office, and I was driving to the office, and I passed this woman who was walking through the puddles on the side of the road to the train. It's going to take her 20 minutes in bad weather to get there. So I pull over and I say, hop in, I'll give you a ride to the train station. And we're talking the whole way. What do you do? She's a senior partner, the most senior marketer at a company that has more than $500 million in assets. And she said, what do you do? And I said, <laughs> funny you should ask. Here's my new book. It came out today. And I handed her one. And she had no idea who I was. And that's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. 99.8% of the people in the world have no idea who I am. And I would say 90% of all marketers have never read a word I've written. Fine with me. So it does. This, there's such a huge gap between what people think of as successful and everyone that I just need to highlight that. So do I feel a responsibility for the million people out of the 7 billion who are kind enough to lend me their ears? Oh, absolutely, every day. That's who I write for. I don't write for me. I write for those people who have chosen to listen. And it's a privilege and it's a thrill, but it's sometimes it's a burden because I don't get to write about what I want today. I get to write about we. And I love doing that. And that's what I'm trying to keep doing. So one of the other themes, um, you know, people like us do things like this that kind of occurs throughout this book. Um, was that a driver for you early on when you were just getting started as an author or just starting the blog? Was was that something that you were really aware of or is this a, a more recent um, understanding you've created? Yeah, that sentence um, came to me about the time I was writing Tribes and my friend and provocateur Bernadette Jiwa challenged me to write a whole book with that title. And that was the original title for This Is Marketing. People like us do things like this. People like us do things like this encapsulates in seven words what it culture is. It encapsulates in seven words what smallest viable audience marketing is. Because first you have to pick who the people like us are. Because it's not everyone. It's people like us. Not who look like us, but who act like us, who believe like us, who fear like us, who dream like us. And things like this is what do we do that other people can see? How do we dress? What do we talk about? What do we buy? Where do we go? People like us do things like this. So if you go to a nudist colony, you will quickly discover that even though everyone's not wearing clothes, everyone is acting in a similar way because you don't define a nudist colony by the fact that people aren't wearing clothes. I've never been. You define it <laughs> by the fact that there is a code of how we talk and where we walk and how we look and all those people like us do things like this things. And on Bizarro World, another planet, they are probably have nudist colonies that are totally different than ours. And so that's our job as marketers is to make the definition of what the things like this are. So maybe the the paradox or the compliment to that is this idea of you're not necessarily competitors when you're on the same board. You know, I've I've kind of unpacked perceptual maps before and X Y axes, but right. it's it's um it challenges your logic to think if we're on the same board, how we could not be competitors. But can you right. kind of talk through that a little bit? Sure. So behind me are all these books, and many of them have blurbs on the back, right? Mm -hmm. How often do you see Tim Cook writing on the back of a Google phone? I like this phone a lot. You should buy it. People <laughs> in many industries do not support each other, but book, but authors do all the time. And in fact, books sell better in bookstores next to their competitors than they sell in hardware stores. And the reason is simple, because if you walk into the bookstore, you've announced you want to buy a book. But a book on crochet and a book on weightlifting, don't compete. You're not saying, which one should I buy? You have a problem, it solves it. And that's where we go with this positioning thing, which is positioning is not how do you get more than your fair share? It's how do you help your customers become unconfused and find what they wanted all along? 
So how would a professional services business be able to position its, itself in a way that is um, both meaningfully different and, as you put it in the book, uh, generous and meaningful? So tell me, uh, give me a prototype firm that you have in mind. An, so architect, an architect. An architect with 50 great. employees. Architect is a great example. So Frank Lloyd Wright designed Falling Water in 15 minutes on the back of a paper bag. And then he said to the client, if you wish, I will build this for you. No focus groups, no meetings, no models to work their way through. If you want a Frank Lloyd Wright building, those are the rules. Right down the street is another architect who says, the kind of architecture we do is collaborative. And we're going to spend a lot of time together. And if you're not prepared to show up with your dream board and with your ideas and with your clippings, please don't hire us. That's not what we do. And right down the street from there is an architect who says, we only do lead certified zero footprint buildings that have no formaldehyde in them. And if you want us to build something other than that, nah, that's not what we do. Here's the phone number of the first guy. You can call him. And each one of them, if they are happy, is happy because of the, they're very specific about what they do. Last night, uh, one of the architects of the World Trade Center came to my house for dinner. If you want an 80-story glass-clad building, you should call him. But if you want a super clever little bungalow, he should send you somewhere else. So it's not just what you build. It's the method that you use to build it, the interaction you have with the client, what you stand for, what story the person will tell after it's done, right? So, you know, if I had to make a living as an architect and I picked something that I knew a little bit about, I would say I'm an architect who actually builds the building for you because I think that that service is more easily understood by the typical person I would seek to serve than here's a bunch of plans, we'll see you later. And so there's a 50, 100 great positions available for architects that would serve confused people as opposed to some clever way of differentiation. I feel like the, um, the stereotype in this industry is that a firm will say, well, our people are what make us different. <laughs> and the problem is the 50 other firms in this market are saying our people are what make us different. Um, so I loved what you said about if you know what you stand for, you don't have to compete. Can you, I know you talked about that a little bit a second ago, but can you unpack that idea of what you stand for? Yeah. So, so that's a line from Bernadette. Um, and, and the idea is if you're, competing on price, it's because you've established that what you do is interchangeable with what other people do. You are not the one and only. It's really difficult for me to figure out an industry where it's easier to avoid that than professional services. Because there are no widgets, can't use a micrometer to measure the tolerance of what you make. You say what sets you apart is your people but you hire your people the same way everyone else hires their people. You compensate your people the same way and your turnover is something you fight as opposed to encourage. So forgive me, but I don't believe you. And if you're not spending 200 hours a year training your people, I don't believe you because basically what you've said is we got a bunch of people. They got a bunch of people. We'd really like your money. And that's not marketing. What do you see as the value of training or how, how does that become a differentiator? Well, so most training doesn't work and it doesn't work because it's enforced. It's compulsory and it's based on command and control and compliance. It's based on school. It's boring and there's a test at the end and the HR person can brag that people went through it. So the reason we started the Alt-MBA is because I abhor all of those things and I see that technology is opening the door. So our Alt-MBA lasts 30 days two to three hours a day. People do it while they're at work. Uh, it's an intensive workshop with no videos in it. I'm not in it. And so we've had almost 3,000 grads. Why does it work? It works because project work, work with no clear answer, work that's fraught with fear and opportunity, the idea that you can engage with people in 40 countries and go faster than you thought you could go. They don't teach that at most places. And yet... 
Those are precisely the things we want our people to be able to do. And so I'm not surprised that HR departments aren't crazy about the Alt-MBA because it doesn't match what they are being measured for. But I know that most training dollars are wasted. Seth, this is a little bit of a curveball, but um, if tomorrow you had to stop writing and speaking and talking about marketing, what else are you passionate enough about that you would want to create a following and to riff on tomorrow? Well, okay, so here's one of two baskets that are in my bookshelf here for bean to bar chocolate. I was within two <laughs> days of starting a bean to bar chocolate company. And then at the last minute, I didn't because Sean Askinosi is such an amazing human. So that's one thing I might do. The other thing I might do is go back to my roots and uh, work at my old summer camp because I still go up there every summer 42 years later. Um, and what would be the third one? Well, people keep coming after me to start that Soba restaurant. So it would be one of those three things or maybe all three of those things. <laughs> Some combination of the three would be amazing. Well, speaking of um, food, I think it was in the supermarket example you were talking about. I love this. This quote was the irrational pursuit of becoming irresistible. <laughs> right. So which part of that do you want me to riff on? So why is it irrational? Because in the short run it's better to meet spec, right? That in the short run, you can say to your boss, we did X, Y, or Z because we have to beat the competition. We did X, Y, or D because it's what people did before us. And that feels rational. It is not particularly effective though because everyone is doing that and so there's no room for you. But I was inspired to write that post by my friend uh, who runs the Apinicon, which is a hotel uh, in, Cal in where is it? Canada. And it's unreasonable to get this much ice cream. You can't see maybe if you're listening to this, but a softball is worth of ice cream for three Canadian dollars. However, it's irresistible because kids beg for it all year round, because parents are happy to go out of their way, because... It's the idyllic, perfect day. And you know what happens? Every once in a while, one of those people says, why don't we stay at this hotel next year for a week when we're on vacation? And so the Pentagon is fully booked every night, nine months in advance, because they made something irresistible that was irrational, which is a softball's worth of ice cream for three Canadian dollars. <laughs> So shifting gears, maybe one last time here. Um, I always thought that quote about the the people aren't buying quarter inch drill bits; they're buying quarter inch size holes. Until you blew a giant hole in that theory, <laughs> can you maybe riff on that one a little bit too? So Ted Levitt, sixty two, sixty three, Harvard Business Review says, get used to the fact that quarter inch drill bits are not in demand. What people want are quarter inch holes. And I'm thinking about that. I go, well, actually, no one actually wants a quarter inch hole. What they want is a place to hold a quarter inch lug nut. But the reason they want that is so that they can hang a shelf. But the reason they want that is so they can clean up the bed and put the books on the bed. And the reason they want that is so when their spouse comes home, they will smile and say, thank you for taking care of our home. Because what they really want isn't a quarter inch drill bit. What they want is satisfaction and security and safety and freedom from fear. That's what people want. So it's really more of a Maslow issue than, uh, than anything else. It always is. Well, Seth, it has been a pleasure talking with you today. Um, I wonder before you go, if there's anything you want to share, um, especially in light of the woman who was in your car and didn't know about you and all the things that you're doing, <laughs> anything about Alt MBA or, um, anything else coming up that our audience should know about? Well, you know, I blog every day and, I figure sooner or later you'll check out the blog, so I'm in no hurry. It gets better, so show up when you want. Seth Stop Blog. If you're interested in the new book, it's at Seth Stop Blog slash TIM, which stands for This Is Marketing. And the Alt MBA starts again next sessions in February, and we would love it if it's for you to check it out, but it might not be for you, and that's okay too. Awesome. Well, Seth, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for making time in your very busy schedule. Well, thank you. These were great questions. It was fun. Awesome. Thank you. 
Holy cow. I cannot believe that just happened. That was awesome to get Seth Godin on the show and on YouTube, youtube.com slash Josh Miles. And be sure and check out the audio version of the podcast over at psm.show. You can also listen to all of the other conversations that I have with David LaCours, my co-host, and some of the other really smart marketers that we've had the opportunity to interview. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. You're fantastic.